CEO of Sunstream. We've got a great turnout. Uh, thank you all for coming out this morning and spending your time with us. Uh, I think something that might be lost uh, a little bit sometimes on, on this budding industry is the fact that we are still in a research phase, if, if not in practice, uh, in law. And in my opinion, what goes hand in hand with research is education. And it's events like these and it's presenters that are gonna be here today that spread uh, spread that research and that work to educate everybody that's really gonna lift uh, this industry off the ground. So I hope that we'll all remember that and we'll all engage in meaningful conversation and, and be open uh, about what's happening because it's very exciting. So uh, if you're not a member of the KYHIA, I, I hope you will be a member by the end of the day. Uh, these are the types of things we want to focus on is, is certainly education one big piece of this and and we also want to listen to whatever you guys have to say about how we can be better as an organization to push the industry forward. So please uh, feel free to open up to myself or Josh or any of the other uh, board members that many of them are here today, if not all of them. I'll tell you a little bit about the company, the background and in general, and then I'm going to talk a bit more kind of uh, hemp centric. Sunstrand is a materials company. Uh, we just happen to manufacture and supply natural or bio materials. Our emphasis in industry is uh, polymer composites, technical non-wovens, and plastics, where we compete with other uh, more traditional materials, synthetic fibers like plastics and glass and carbon fiber. So what we do is we directly contract with farmers for agricultural feedstocks. We work with bamboo, flax, canaf, and of course hemp. Uh, we then manufacture our products, which take the format of fibers or particulates that we call fillers. You might know that generically in the bass industry is decortication. Uh, we then sell our materials to upstream manufacturers, of which there can be several before the end user. And that manufacturer will make something that might be called a preform or injection molding pellets, which go on to be molded and so on and so forth. So we're fairly low in the, in the uh, supply chain. We are a raw material supplier. Turns out that there are people that actually want these materials, uh, hemp fiber in particular, uh, for a few different reasons. First and foremost, reductions in cost compared to existing materials. Reductions in weight is a really uh, great opportunity, particularly in transportation, to reduce weight by as much as 20%. Uh, support for end of life or landfilling, uh, compostability, biodegradability, and, and in general, reduce environmental hazards. And particularly if we're talking about glass fibers and the fabrication of things made out of glass fibers can be hazardous to the health of the individuals doing that. Turns out that uh, manufacturers, while we can provide those kinds of advantages, manufacturers are really excited about the materials because they're attractive. Uh, the, you'll see we have a booth in the other room. I recommend you guys come by and take a look. Uh, some of the materials look really cool and, and uh, sexy even, if you get into materials. Um, <laughs> we do, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Uh, we can also meet other performance metrics like strength and stiffness, and there is an opportunity for manufacturers to get a little bit of extra money by marketing to an eco-friendly customer base. Uh, maybe what's different about our team than, than many others is we're not farmers. We don't pretend to be farmers. We engage great resources like the University of Kentucky and Dr. David Williams and his colleagues to help us figure that out. Uh, but we came from the industries that we serve. Uh, most of us are engineers or scientists out of the polymers or the automotive or composites industry. So we really understand those industries and what they need as a material supply source. So we understand material specifications. Um, and that doesn't begin, that's, that's not just us, it's, uh, it goes down the line. Garbage in to our process is garbage out. So in order for us to meet the specifications of our customers, the material we acquire from the farmer has to meet our specifications as well. But it's actually not that hard to do. Well, there's nuances. First of all, I want to ask you, which one of these is hemp? Shout it out. No, only the bottom left one. <laughs> uh, so, you know, one thing that I like to, to let everybody know is that hemp is a choice. It's not a necessity. And uh, manufacturers have options. There's other plants, canaf, flax, jute. They're all part of the same family called bast uh, bass plants or bass fibers. And for hemp to be successful, it has to compete, okay? It's not the only thing there. Uh, and I think it, we'd be all good to recognize that there's competition, uh, but that hemp is actually, uh, you know, it has a place in industry. Um, so generally the term thrown around in, in, in hemp is decortication. There's not one magic decorticator machine that, you know, you can just go down and, and fabricate, at least not on an industrial scale. Certainly on an artisan scale, you can do that, and that's sort of how I tend to di differentiate. Artisan is typically more fed by hand. It may be one little machine. It may be a guy uh, with a handbrake. Industrial processes are focused on centralized models that, that process big standard bales. 
Uh, that's a picture of our, one of our storage uh, areas down the bottom right. And I don't know who the guy is on the left. Maybe he's in this room. I'm not sure. But, uh, so like I said, the technology exists right now to do this. It's not, it's not fantasy. It, we don't need anything new. We don't need anything special. Um, I mean, arguably, there's always chances for improvements. I'm not going to say that. Uh, you know, they can definitely make improvements. But today, it does exist, and generally in the two formats, be it artisan or industrial, uh, of which, of course, you know, we focus on the industrial. Generically, decortication is a process of mechanically separating the outer fiber sheath from the inner woody core called herd. Uh, a little bit about our work is we tend to focus on standard production processes. We want to make it as easy as possible on the farmer to adopt our crops. We want to be as close to a drop in, if you know, ideally a drop into the rotation, particularly with corn and soybeans. Uh, we're not really, you know, our, our style doesn't really work well on a tobacco model per se, but certainly does on a traditional row crop model. Uh, you, you know, typically using a seed drill to put the seeds in and you're gonna let it grow and, and get big and tall and you come in and mow it uh, and then you're gonna tet it. Um, and after that, you're gonna bale it. It's not super complicated, but there's some nuances along the way. I think a lot of people in this room probably have all that equipment already. So the idea that you need to buy uh, new equipment to do the harvesting is not necessarily true. Uh, there are processes uh, that other people employ that might require a specialty harvester, not Sunstrand. We wanna, we take that onerous on ourselves to ensure that we can take you know, something from the farmer that makes sense to, to you guys that you already have equipment to do. Uh, we work you know, really hard to achieve that and of course UK is a great partner in that respect. So we take round bales, standard large square bales or round bales. We prefer square bales uh, because of transportation costs. You can get 15,000 more pounds of material on a truck which adds up after a while. Uh, but either one works just as well in our process. Uh, so currently we are at what we call a, a we operate a pilot plant and um, the pilot plant is meant to show you know competency I guess it's to show that we can do this on a reliable consistent basis we can deliver industrial scales although be it small industrial scales so our plant is about a six million pound a year plant right now operating in Louisville Kentucky um, that's about three thousand tons a year an industrial big brother version of our plant would be about a little over 40 million pounds a year, about 22,000 pounds. No significant difference in the technology at all. It's just a matter of scaling and making it bigger. In general, we're focused on delivering short fibers. So that's going to be less than six inches long, all the way down to a quarter inch. Uh, and, and the cleanliness can range. Uh, you know, in the uh, the upper uh, the upper extreme, be around 30, 35 percent herd in your fiber, which would be like a paper application. Uh, down to sub 3%, which is going to be a highly technical application. And we're actually working on trials now for, for spinning, long and short staple spinning, although that's not really our, our core focus. Right now, I think we're the only people that can actually make hemp fiber in the United States. So, so we've been engaged in a variety of different departures, I guess, from our normal business activities. Uh, these are some pictures of our line right here. You can see on the right one, uh, that's one of our technicians, John. We load in full bales on one end, and out the other end comes clean fiber. It takes about 16 machines to do that. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite an involved process, capital intensive. Uh, trust me, we've, we've invested in this industry and uh, you can see right there a small portion of our plant. Uh, so, so a little bit more about fiber properties and the future potential of the industry. So I, I guess I'd like to a little bit more on some realities around hemp. Uh, what hemp is not. It's not the strongest natural fiber on the planet. <coughs> hemp is not as strong as glass fiber. Hemp is not antimicrobial. Hemp is not compatible with all major industrial manufacturing processes. Um, however, it does have a good strength to weight ratio. Uh, it is lightweight and low density, uh, as are all natural fibers, but, but hemp has a lower density than, than carbon fiber, hence the opportunities for reductions in weight. It's cost competitive at industrial scale, but per perhaps the most important thing about hemp is its versatility. And you'll see that if you just walk in the other room to see some of the, uh, the booths over there, the, all the different things you can do with hemp. No other plant can actually do that. And that's what really gives hemp its strength uh, and will secure its place as an industrial commodity. It's because we don't have to rely on one single application for the plant itself. And the industry can grow around that. So that's very exciting. Um, it is very variable, as with all natural fibers. And that's really the hemp is not the strongest natural fiber on plant. Yeah, here we go. Good. This is data. One thing we do a lot is we test a lot. We spend a lot of time, we have a laboratory, we're gonna do mechanical characterization. We also have a wet lab, which means we can do chemistry for various upgrading processes. 
Uh, these are, this chart, I don't expect you to know what this chart is saying exactly, but the point is we've got bamboo, canaf, hemp, and jute on here. And generally you want the line to be steep and you want it to keep going up as far as possible. And so you can see that uh, hemp isn't the steepest. It also doesn't go up as high as the highest on the graph. So, you know, but at the end of the day, it's still well-rounded, still has good properties. All of these are highly variable dependent on uh, the work in the farm and the work on us as processors. So the, they, they can fluctuate all across the board in terms of properties. Uh, one of the things we try to do is maintain a consistent supply to our customers, extremely important. Uh, so in summary, hemp is incredibly versatile, fiber, grain, oil, CBD. Um, it has, it's a great fiber, but it does have competition and it has to, you know, has to compete at cost and performance metrics with its competition. There's lots of potential market applications. Um, you know, I sort of said three different technologies, plastics, composites, non-wovens, but the applications are, are all over the place, right? Building materials, sporting goods, automotive, consumer goods, so on and so forth. You know, it's, it's almost mind-boggling the number of applications that you could use. Um, technology exists today to make this happen. Okay, we don't need anything crazy. We can do this. I mean, we're literally doing this. Maybe not today because my entire, most of my team is here, but, um, but at any rate. Uh, so, and, and we also expect support for a significant amount of farmland. Uh, our planned industrial process will support at least 5,000 acres. Um, that's at five ton yield uh, at the farm, which looks to be okay for fiber purpose grown crop. But we can also do stuff with dual purpose, which is pretty exciting, which is primary growing for Green. Thank you, Trey. Well done.